So I'm going to go ahead and jump into my presentation. Um, just a little bit of background about donkeys in general. So at the moment, we think that there's about 41 million donkeys worldwide. However, most of these donkeys are going to be in developing countries, and we don't have a great um, way of accurately estimating the wild population of donkeys. Even just thinking about the wild population in the Caribbean, we've had a really big struggle to be able to actually define how to map out where the donkeys are and be able to create an accurate estimate of how many donkeys we have. Um, those of you familiar with St. Kitts and Nevis, we have many people telling us that we have an overpopulation of donkeys, but when we try to get the exact number, people will tell us anywhere from 2,000 to 6,000. And so even just thinking about our tiny island and the population within our island, we get that there's a very difficult way of actually being able to um, manage that population and being able to actually estimate the number that are there. So specifically going into the Caribbean and why we had such an interest in being able to sort of identify and do more research in this area, there is an overpopulation or at least a conceived overpopulation of donkeys within the Caribbean islands. Um, the donkeys were brought over initially for help with manual labor and being able to sort of create and build different um, types of hierarchy and structures. Now we've moved into a more technologically advanced time frame and therefore these donkeys have sort of returned back into the wild and here especially in the Caribbean we have a very tropical um, climate and therefore they can actually reproduce year-round and with that they do reproduce year-round so um, you'll find later in my talk I'll talk about that it's very difficult to find a non-pregnant female donkey on the islands um, with that, we see that we have kind of this surge in population and therefore can our island actually sustain how much animal um, is there. And it can, for the most part, when we think about sort of the rainy season and the lush forests and areas that we have. But when we get into the area or time of drought, we see that they have sort of limited resources. And therefore, we do start to see a change in their body condition scores. And then we start to see that there is some welfare concerns that happens there. We also have sort of this human-animal conflict that comes into play. And so here we're thinking about we think we have an overpopulation of donkeys, but when you go and you actually talk to the inhabitants of Nevis and St. Kitts, um, they think there's an overpopulation of donkeys because they get in the way. They stand on the roads, um, they're out on our landing strips, they're on the golf courses, and so here it's it's a perceived problem because they're always around and they're always kind of causing problems um, within the community that we have. And so it's a very interesting dynamic that we're managing. Just to give you a little bit more perspective, this is Nevis. Um, and this is a, probably a typical picture that you would see if you were driving around the island. Um, a, a little harem of donkeys, a group, generally three or four females with an offspring or two around. And then typically we would see some male donkeys um, more alone, so usually standing off by themselves. But when you look at this picture, you don't necessarily think, oh man, I feel sorry for those donkeys, right? You think, oh, that's a nice place for them to live. Now, in Nevis, that is true, and typically we kind of have a more of a human-animal conflict that we think about. Now, skip over to this picture. This is one of my colleagues took a picture from Barbuda. And now Barbuda has an overpopulation of donkeys, and these donkeys are found sort of anywhere and everywhere, not just out in sort of lush green pastures that you might see here. This picture specifically is donkey near a landfill, and so Barbuda has landfills that then they burn, and these donkeys will actually be seen walking through the burning um, garbage that's there, and even trying to tear open these garbage bags to find some resources and some type of feed for themselves and so it's kind of hard to see you'll have to sort of look in close to your screen but a singed tail there's very little hair kind of around their fetlocks um, you might even see burned marks and so here we do have a, a, a very real overpopulation where they aren't able to sort of sustain themselves on the resources that they have on that island so going into some details about how population control has happened so in the past and 
um, sort of methods that have been used would be lethal removal. And so this has been an approved method that has been used within the Caribbean islands. And I say generally in the past, um, but in 2017, there was a report that the government was actually offering money for um, dead carcasses to be to be available. And so we don't know that this is true. Um, we are on Nevis quite often. And so we've never seen evidence of this actually happening. The government has never spoken about this. Um, but we do know that this has been a method that has been used um, and is somewhat of a inhumane but um, available method to sort of decrease the population that's there. Moving into sort of the surgical castration attempt at population control, um, many of us think about, you know, being able to sterilize a male and being able to sort of decrease the population. The unfortunate part is that just sterilizing one male isn't going to work. We have to try to sterilize every male in order to really decrease that population or at least control the growth of that population. This takes one male to be able to fertilize many, many females, and then we'll still see an increase in that population. So really and truly the practicality and um, sort of availability of being able to collect up every wild male donkey would be very difficult for us and not something that um, would be available in a wild population. So that moves us into the immunocontraceptives. And so that's kind of the the point of this project and why we got really excited about it. Now, there's two main immunocontraceptives that we generally think about, um, GnRH and then the porcine zona pellucida product. GnRH is typically the, the immunocontraceptive um, creates an antibody to the GnRH, and then that sort of allows a stop in the downstream effects of the reproductive cycle. So all the hormones that are supposed to be released because GnRH starts the cycle um, are stopped, and that's the goal behind that immunocontraceptive. Now, there is an immunocontraceptive that is labeled for the use in, in wild donkeys, um, but I cannot find any um, sort of published literature on the effects of an actual population to do that. And, and the literature that I do find um, really talks about the horses and wild horses that have been used. And a lot of the literature that has been coming out lately talks about the behavioral effects. So here, if we have a wild population of animals and we're changing sort of the sexual behaviors that typically would help and allow that hierarchical stance, we're going to change their overall behaviors and what type of effect are we going to have there. So we don't think about GnRH, or at the moment we're not going to think about GnRH um, anymore. We're going to move more into this porcine zona pellucida product. And so the PZP product was created or made um, with the thought that we would create antibodies specifically to the zona pellucida. And so here we're creating an antibody to the outer covering of this egg where the sperm would bind to. And that way, in theory, the animal would cycle appropriately, but when it came time for fertilization, we would block that level of fertilization. And so that would be the goal and the reason that we focus a lot on PZP. The PZP product has been used successfully in over 90 different species, um, and, and it is a very effective um, product. However, it does have some native portion of the porcine, right? And so there are some um, porcine antigens that are in there that would make this a little bit hard to create, so it's a difficult um, vaccine. And when we think about import and exportation, we have to sort of think about the fact that it's going to have an animal product in it. And some countries are not going to allow the import of this. And so we have to be very careful about that. So that led my collaborators to thinking about this recombinant zona pellucida product. And so the recombinant zona pellucida product is specifically looking at zona pellucida proteins three and four. And so it's trying to look at specific products or specific areas that we think will really focus um, and allow for us to create a very clean vaccine that could maybe sort of take out any of the artifactual changes that we have. And so that was sort of the goal about creating a vaccine that could be um, imported and exported a little bit easier and manufactured a bit easier. So I, I was going to go into a bit more details. It specifically was created in the Council for Scientific Industrial Research 
research, um, our collaborators at CSIR. And we've done quite a few experiments. My collaborators have done quite a few experiments using them in horses and have found some similar results in PZP. And so as PZP. And so we have kind of this thought that we're on the right track of creating something very similar that would maybe have a cleaner effect. So that leads us into our specific study and the study that we have here in the donkeys and being able to sort of look at the native PZP product and the recombinant zona pellucida product, specifically in the donkeys in the Caribbean. So I'm going to go through two studies. My initial study, I'm going to give you all the materials and methods and kind of go through all the results. And then my second study follows the same study design, and so we'll be able to go through it a bit quicker. So I'll spend a bit more time kind of going into the details of this first one. So in the first study, we collected up 25 pregnant donkeys. Um, and again, it was difficult really to find non-pregnant donkeys. So um, we kind of had to think, okay, find really pregnant donkeys and we'll let them actually go through their parturition and full out. And so uh, this was an added bonus that we could say, absolutely, we have a fertile donkey. We got to play with a lot of foals, which was really fun. And then after they all fold out, we were able to monitor their cycle and make sure that they all were cycling normally. So once all 25 donkeys fold and return to a normal cycle, then they were randomly put into three different treatment groups. And so we have our recombinant group, we have our native PZP group, and then a control group. And so in this study, we had nine in the recombinant group and then eight in both our native and control group. So when we think about the recombinant group, one of the factors is that we actually have two boosters. So we're going to have an initial vaccine, and again, it's that just the zona pellucida 3 and 4 proteins, and then we have a booster that will follow with um, our vaccine 2 and 3. Our native vaccine is just one, um, initial one initial vaccine and then a booster, and then our control followed the native vaccine with just the two um, inoculations. And so when we look at that on kind of a schematic, we'll see that we have the recombinant group starting earlier. So our goal was to have all the final boosters happen at exactly the same time. So our recombinant group started earlier, and then all of our um, other groups followed in that second vaccine. Now, originally, the native vaccine is said to come with, or it, it is produced and sent with Freund's modified complete adjuvant. And so those of you that aren't familiar, Freund's adjuvant is a very immunogenic adjuvant. It has a lot of oomph into, in it. And so this is very helpful with actually getting sort of the response that we want, but we can see that we have some reactions that can happen to it. And we do, and so we'll talk about that in this study. But we followed the same um, product device, and we put Freund's Modified Complete Adjuvant with our initial vaccine and then the incomplete adjuvant with our booster. And because of the reactions that we had and, and what we think were due mainly to our adjuvant, we ended up doing our third vaccination in just saline. With our native PZP, we were able to follow sort of the manufacturer guidelines and do our two vaccines in the complete adjuvant and incomplete, and then our controls got just the adjuvant um, and then and not following that same pattern. Five weeks after the final booster, we put a fertile jack in with each treatment group and then we transferred the fertile jack in between each treatment group as we went. So we made sure that everybody got to see a different jack throughout the time frame of the of the experiment. So here's all the project parameters that we looked at. We really wanted to see kind of what exactly a reaction we were going to get from these vaccines. And so we monitored for vaccine reactions. We looked at antibody titers, specifically looking for PZP versus the recombinant group. And then I'm a, a reproductive specialist, and so in my heart, I wanted to know exactly what was happening on the ovary. And so we followed really closely to what was happening on the ovaries and the uterus, and then looking at pregnancy rates and even what types of behaviors these um, donkeys were showing. So just to go into sort of the, the de details of these materials, for the vaccine reaction, we looked at temperature, pulse, respiration, and body wall measurement. And so we did each of these on the day of vaccination, 
and then every day after. And so for the body wall measurement, we actually used an, um, an ultrasound, and we were able to do sort of a transcutaneous measurement of the body wall where we had given the vaccine. And so it was pretty easy to follow, pretty easy to monitor, and actually be able to get a nice measurement over time. Um, temperature, pulse, and respiration, we had many students helping us, and so we were able to sort of quickly get all of this information and be able to analyze that data. I see some of my students are on here, so special shout out to them for all of their help. Really appreciate them. So, so then we got to look at their behavior. So those of you that don't have any familiarity with donkeys, um, their sexual receptivity is very, very interesting. It is not something that you would expect. So we would bring all the donkeys up and they would actually stand around the pasture. So we would tie them to um, posts around a little pasture. And then inside that pasture would be our jack. And this jack loved his job. He was very happy to go and say hi to each and every female every time that they got to come up. And then the females that were not in heat or were not showing signs of sexual receptivity would basically just ignore him. So he'd kind of walk away and, and move on to the next one. Those that did show signs of receptivity would do a very interesting sort of mouth clapping. And so they clap their mouths, they'll sort of drool, and then they pin their ears back. And then as they show even more interest, they show even more aggression. So it's very interesting. They'll start to kick, and then they will show kind of a similar um, urination. They'll turn their hind end towards them and actually urinate similar to what we think about with horses in that respect. But the rest of it is a is very aggressive and kind of surprising behaviors that many of you might not expect until you get to see it. So then on the same day we'd bring them up, we'd also do our transrectal ultrasonography. And so here, we looked at several different measurements, specifically kind of looking at effects within our uterus and then really wondering what's happening at the level of the ovary. So looking at our follicular development and then luteal development, um, seeing what that would normally be happening and being able to compare between our treatment groups. And so um, really interesting information that came out of that. Also weekly, we would take some blood. So we do some blood collection. And with that information, we were actually able to do our antibody titers and then follow along with a progesterone amount that would just kind of help us um, correlate what was happening clinically to what was happening um, physiologically. And so that was just some nice extra information. So here we go with some of our results. We're gonna start with our antibody titers and then go through our reproductive behavior. And I'll end with our vaccine reactions. So the first thing that we wanted to make sure was that we did in fact have an antibody response. And so the green line that you see represented here would be the um, native PZP. And so yes, we got a really nice antigenic response from them. Um, the arrows up here would represent the different vaccination timeframes. And again, our native PZP would just be the second and third, um, so its initial injection and then its booster. And then ReZP would be the three, so they would have that initial one earlier. Our recombinant vaccine also had a really nice response, and so we were really happy that both of our treatment groups had some nice antigenic simulation. And then, of course, our control group had none, so we're happy with that. We're going to talk a bit more in detail about the titer towards the end of the talk. There's some interesting things that we sort of pulled out of that um, that I'll bring up for sort of future studies. So here was kind of the exciting part of the project. So we'll start here with our control group and look at sort of the reproductive behaviors and what happened with each one of our groups. So the control group, everybody got pregnant. And most of them got pregnant within 77 days. And so typically we think about this 10 to 11 weeks after we put the jack out, they were pregnant. And so this is a very sort of normal response. This is exactly what we see in, in the wild. And so um, absolutely sort of the fertile jennies that we expected to have. Now let's move into our recombinant group. Only two out of the recombinant group got pregnant. And we took this study all the way to 232 days. And so 
We took it quite a long time, um, kind of waiting to see if we would have any pregnancies or have any sort of changes that would happen. So only two got pregnant. They got pregnant very late in the study, so 214 days into the study. Um, but the really, really interesting part was that nine out of nine of them had what we're going to term as ovarian shutdown. And so here we're going to see that their ovaries completely stopped sort of cycling. We saw no follicular or luteal development, and they went into just this period of non-cyclicity. And then those two that got pregnant were able to recover and then get pregnant. And so super interesting. We saw them, the, the median time to them going into that non-cyclic time to be around 77 days. So the same time that all of our controls were getting pregnant, all of our treatment group with a recombinant protein were getting or going into a non-cycling um, time frame. So PZP group kind of following a similar pattern. Only one out of the eight got pregnant. That one got pregnant at 196 days, and that one was actually the only one that stayed cycling throughout the whole time, but had a very delayed time to getting pregnant. And then the other seven out of the eight had ovarian shutdown. So similar sort of results went into a non-cycling period. We saw no reproductive behaviors, and they went into that shutdown a little bit earlier. So we saw them kind of um, go into this non-cycling period even earlier than our recombinant group. So really interesting results. Just to give you a bit more clarity and kind of an overall picture as to what's happening. When we look here, these are the vaccination days. And then we're looking at um, sort of the days after the final booster. We see again that the follicles, and then if you look over here, that our uterine diameter are going to completely disappear and become very, very small. And so just really giving you this idea that all of their reproductive tissues are going to become kind of um, just inactive. So the, the uterus becomes really small. The ovary becomes really small. We just have nothing going on. And so that's going to change their reproductive behaviors. Um, and that's going to cause some different sort of um, just behavior in general. So overall, right, we found in that first study, we had some really nice immunocontraceptive. Um, they didn't get pregnant, and unfortunately, they also showed, you know, non-cycling times. But in theory, we did create kind of a nice immunocontraceptive. Here's where the problem comes in. So we had really major vaccine reactions. And so we did give the vaccines in the gluteal muscles. Um, we are trying to sort of mimic what we would do out in a normal population, a wild population, and so we would dart into sort of the bigger muscle group, and that would be the gluteals. And then we saw, unfortunately, in pretty much all of our treatment groups that we had some vaccine reactions. And so if you look at the blue, so just focus only on the blue, the recombinant group after the initial vaccine had a really high level of vaccine reaction, and that second vaccine, 100% of our animals had vaccine reactions. Remember, I ch we changed it and we put saline in that third vaccine, and even then we had some reactions. And so we were pretty um, nervous or pretty unhappy with sort of the vaccine reaction level. We prefer that that ne not necessarily be so big and effective or, or ineffective in this case. So here, PZP, the native group, we had 75% in both of the vaccine times frames, and then even our control groups that just got the adjuvant had some really um, nasty vaccine reactions. And we did some cultures on these. We know that it was a sterile environment. We know that it specifically came from the vaccination, um, not from any type of a sort of um, contaminant that was put in there. And so um, we had to do some major um, wound management and some of these animals were pretty lame. And so for us, when we think about this initial study, we got great results as far as the immunocontraceptive side. But when we think about putting this into a wild population, we're a little concerned that we would be causing some harm. And so this would not be something we'd want to do. That was also the reason that we kind of stop the study. So at 232 days, we still had non-cycling animals, but in our minds, we wouldn't be using this vaccination in a, in a field operation. So we decided to kind of stop the study then and move on to the next study. 
So here in the next study, we had 27 donkeys, 27 pregnant donkeys that we collected. We let all the pregnant donkeys fall out. And then um, unfortunately, we had two that just decided they weren't going to cycle back and be normal for us. And so we had 25 donkeys, same as our first study. So we'll have uneven treatment groups again, but we're used to it, so it's okay. We randomly put those 25 donkeys within the same treatment groups. So we have a recombinant group that had only eight, and then our native PZP with nine, and then our control group with eight. So here, we're going to use really, really similar antigens. Um, I will say that in this study, the um, recombinant zona pellucida vaccination was modified, and so slightly tweaked at every point when we move forward. We make some slight modifications, but this is the main factor. We decided to use a different adjuvant. And so here, we're using a combination of PETGLA and PolyIC, and then a small amount of saline. Um, and so the collaborators in Pretoria found that this was a very um, safe but antigenic type of an adjuvant. So it would help give us that response, but not necessarily cause sort of the vaccine reaction that we had with the Freund's modified complete. And so that's what we're kind of looking for. So moving in, we did exactly the same sort of study design. We had our initial recombinant vaccination start prior. Then we had everybody else come in at the second booster, so our initial vaccines for native and control. And then for the last final booster, all happened at week 10 in this case, and then fertile jacks were put in and transferred between the treatment groups. Had all of the same reproductive parameters, all of the same antibody titers and vaccine reaction monitoring, so all of the same sort of materials and methods that we would have gone through with our initial study design. So here we're just going to jump straight into our results. And I will say um, with the COVID-19 issue, we've definitely had some delay in being able to get all of these results um, sort of put together and, and, and able to get it all finished. Um, our, our antibody titers, unfortunately, are the main things that we're still waiting for. Um, we have all of the, the supplies that we need. We just need to be able to actually work in a lab. And right now with the pandemic, we're very um, sort of on lockdown, so not being able to actually do much. But I'll give you some of our preliminary results. And the first one I will say is our vaccine reactions. So very, very happy to say we had no vaccine reactions. We monitored after every vaccine. Um, we looked at temperature, pulse, and respiration, and our body wall, and had no changes. So I'm very happy with the, the effect, I suppose, of the vaccine, that we didn't have any sort of local or systemic problems. But let's see if it actually worked. And so let's move into these reproductive parameters. So giving you some slightly different ways of, of giving that information. So I'm going to go over this first um, presentation or this first graph for you guys, and then we'll use the same um, for looking at our other treatment groups. So over here we have the Jennies, and these are just the numbers of the Jennies that were randomly assigned to the control groups. And then the day zero in this case is going to be initial vaccination day. And then where this line is, is when the jacks were put in. So this is that 15 week mark when the jacks were put in. So green is going to represent when the animal was cycling. And so all of the green just shows that they were all normally cycling. The jacks were put in at this line. And when things turned red is when they got pregnant. And so when they got pregnant, they were put off the study or they, that was the end of the study for them. So here you can see our controls did exactly as we expected and the same as our first study. Within 2 to 15 weeks after the jacks were put in, all of the controls were pregnant. And so I'm um, very happy. Jacks are happy. Everybody's working like they're supposed to, right? Here we get into our native PZP results. And so again, green, our Jennies are over here, just the random numbers that were assigned. Um, green meaning that they all cycled normally. Here's our black line when our jacks would have put in but now we're gonna have some blue. And so this blue is gonna represent when these animals became non-cyclic. So these are the time frames when they went into a period where they weren't actually showing that reproductive cycles. And very, very interesting that some of them did show non-cyclicity and some of them didn't. But no matter what, 
even if they did show cyclicity, even if they cycled normally, so these are the top three are kind of good representatives, we still see that we had a really long delay in pregnancy. And so the first pregnancy we saw was after 15 weeks of um, the jacks being in. So the same time when all of the controls were finally pregnant, we see that now we're starting to have some of our treatment groups be pregnant. So a little bit of a delay to the pregnancy. And then we have those that are actually just non-cyclic. And so we went out 55 weeks, or I think it ended up being 380 or so days from the initial vaccination. And so almost a complete year. And we still had two, one that was cycling but not pregnant, and then one that was not cycling at the end of our study. Um, but you can kind of see we had some really mixed results and interesting results that are happening in this study um, that we're, we're really excited to sort of um, get into the details of. Same with our recombinant groups. So maybe not quite as much of the non-cyclicity, but definitely the same um, delay to pregnancy. So green kind of representing that cycling but again sort of the first pregnancy that we saw was 19 weeks after the jacks were put in so a delay to pregnancy and then we did see times of non-cyclicity in some of these animals and then this one girl the last two down here are really interesting to me um she cycled all the way through and then finally got pregnant on the last week that we did the study um so it took a long time we we see some really interesting and kind of mixed results that were really excited to explore and be able to sort of define what exactly is kind of changing in these animals and what level are we seeing um, this immunocontraceptive effect at. So I'm a very visual person. I like to see things kind of all on one page. And so I just put all of them together. So you get a really nice representative of what kind of our normal control Jennies would do versus what happened in our PZP and then our recombinant group. And, and really interesting sort of non-cyclicity that was mixed in there. Um, that That's where we're really excited to sort of explore and get a bit more information. I will say that this is very similar to what um, Margaret Nolan has published, um, same group of collaborators, and they worked with pony mares. And so really similar sort of mixed results that she found um, in the pony mares that they had and, and kind of the effects that they have. So here I'm just, I, I promised you I tell you a bit more about titers. And so here I'll give you a bit more of those details. Bear with me, it's a little complicated, okay? So these dashed lines, the top and the bottom dashed lines are just gonna represent sort of the confidence interval of what we're looking at. So we're not gonna focus too much on the dashed lines, but we're gonna look at this solid line. So this solid line represents the mean antibody titers of all of our dockies, okay? So we put them all together and everything we're looking at is from day 35. So this is 35 days after that initial vaccine. And so here we're finding that um, we had a threshold. So 17,000 mean antibody titer basically was the threshold that anything higher than that antibody titer meant that those donkeys were more prone to this ovarian shutdown or this non-cyclicity. And so we're seeing a titer effect that's actually sort of increasing the um, the, the non-cyclicity, and so potentially that immunocontraceptive level of this vaccine. So we didn't go into a lot of details on the first set of titers. We did only go out until day 70, but because of the box river funding that we have and because of some of the interesting results we got from the first study, we're gonna really be able to go into those details on the second study. And so we're super interested to be able to follow each one of those donkeys and those donkeys that had sort of the non-cyclicity time and then cycling time, we can actually follow those titers on a bi-weekly parameter to be able to see what exact changes are we seeing. So really excited. That's kind of what we still have going. That's what we're um, looking forward to the results for and then being able to do some of our statistical analysis on that second study and get some of those really nice um, details out for you guys. The other study that we're super interested in doing is looking at the level of the ovary. And so we're hoping to be able to use that recombinant vaccine specifically and then see 
are we getting changes within the follicles? So are we seeing that we have this non-cycling timeframe because we're having some effects at the follicular stage? And so kind of changing what we're thinking about with that mechanism of action and where the effect of this vaccine is actually having. So really looking forward to those future studies. I just wanna take this opportunity to thank all of the students, this is like a tiny little portion of these students. Um, it, we've done this project for four years now, and so I think we've got over a hundred different students that have been involved with it. Um, big thanks to many of my collaborators, <clears throat> excuse me, specifically a lot of thanks to Dr. Eric Peterson, who's kind of been the right hand man and helped me through all of these different projects and kind of. Um, troubleshooting how to work with donkeys because they are not small horses so it's been very interesting um, our collaborators in pretoria dr Bert Schinger and shulman have been great and have given us, us a lot of information and kind of helped us with a lot of our designs um, dr darren noble and dr gilbert at ross have been excellent collaborators and sort of mentors for me um, dr or robin roth at csir has been sort of our um, go-to person for these vaccines and many many more here at Ross that have helped us. I, I just put up a few of these names of the students. These are just a few of my research assistants. Um, really special thanks to sort of my original set of students um, and then extra special thanks to my most recent master's student, Brittany Middlebrooks, who really kind of took a lot of the lead for the, the second study as I was on maternity leave for some of it. So I really appreciate all the efforts and um, huge lots and lots of thanks to Bostober for the funding. Without them, none of this would have actually been able to happen. So with that, I will take some questions. I hope I didn't go too long. <laughs> I think you're good. Thank you so much, Dr. French. We really appreciate it. Um, yes. So with that, we're gonna start the Q&A session. My name is Stephanie Boyles Griffin, and I'm the Science and Policy Director for the Botstever Institute for Wildlife Fertility Control. Um, we already have a few comments and questions. Um, Dr. French, can you see the Q&A or do I need yeah. to read this out to you? No, um, I can see them, I think. Uh, let me start with one question I had for you and then we'll go to the ones that are on the, uh, on the list there to the right. Um, I wanted to know why you were using three injections of the recombinant ZP rather than just two and what your, your thoughts on the future of that are, do you think you know, moving forward, if you were to do another study like this, would you change the dose of the recombinant ZP in either the initial primer or booster doses? Would you need to do three? Could you just do two? Just curious about that. Yeah, I mean, so uh, uh, idealistically, right, we would want one vaccine because we're thinking about wild populations. So we want to dart these animals one time only and we want to see the effect. Unfortunately, with the, the antigens that we have, we don't think that we're getting a great stimulus. And so we're still kind of in the process of getting this vaccine to its, its actual correct standpoint. And so um, we're still working with our Pretoria collaborators and the CSIR collaborators on modifying the vaccine to get it exactly where we need it to be. So we could cut it down to at least two injections, if not maybe a one injection vaccination. Um, but we're still sort of finding our, our happy place with the vaccine. Um, and so I don't think at this point we're prepared to cut down any of the boosters we still want to get the exact antigenic response um but you know that is a future thought and specifically you know working with these titers and sort of the the difference of how some of these animals are responding and not responding we're hoping to be able to work through some of those details yeah uh thank you so much for that um so um there are some just general comments from folks that know you that wanted to say hi <laughs> Do you know? yeah. Smith, uh, zachary young um but chelsea did have a question she said do we have any idea of why uh she says the two pregnant do you know what she's referring to there yeah so in the original study we had two donkeys that went into uh, well so all nine of them right went into a non-cycling time frame and then those two donkeys actually just recovered and so 
again, we think that it probably has something to do with just their responses to the vaccine and the fact that they sort of moved out of that non-cycling time frame and then were able to cycle again. And, and we know that they're fertile. So the second that they cycle, they're going to get pregnant. Um, it's, it's just a, a vaccine response. And we were lucky enough to have gone that long that we were able to see them kind of recover from the vaccine and then still be fertile afterwards, which was a nice kind of bonus for us. Right. And then Dave Powell has a question for you. Are the pregnancy rates at day, approximately day 232 similar? Yes. Um, so the pregnancy rates is so two out of eight and one out of nine were sort of our, our really similar results that we had between PZP and recombinant group. Um, so um, it, they're, they are similar in, in most ways. Um, we did see a little bit earlier pregnancy in the PZP group, but, um, you know, very limited responses that that kind of show the immunocontraceptive effect. Um, and then again, yeah, 232 day was just the day that we decided, you know what, let's let's stop this study and focus on the second study and being able to sort of modify these vaccinations. I think he also asked about titers here. Yes. Um, and, and so I maybe got to that towards the end of the talk. Um, so we didn't run on the first study, we didn't run our titer samples beyond day 70. Um, we, we just mainly wanted to see that we had a response and then we kind of stopped um, our assays after that um, funding wise, just couldn't quite follow them all the way through. Um, there, there's a question here about the vaccine reactions and so, I think if we if we targeted them that they had a vaccine reaction, um, it was a, a significant enough that we saw in sort of an increase or a contour change in that gluteal muscle space, so in the rump space that they had there. And we do understand that in horses, it generally is a mild effect. Um, and that was, a, you know, one of the things that these donkeys are just not horses and they do have a much smaller muscle mass in that space and so we're just thinking that it's just much more pronounced um because of sort of the, the smaller just body mass that they have um so right. it, is, it is interesting um so i'll respond to a couple of questions that are not necessarily about the content of the presentation but about uh where people can see it from this point forward so we have a uh a, just a comment from elizabeth tilly uh i noticed this is being recorded i would love to have access to watch later how do i go about acting it later so we the bot steber institute is going to post it on our website for people to watch in perpetuity so after watching it once or twice if you have any other questions as monique said you can get in touch with dr french directly um grace uh, kaler has asked how often did you present the jacks to the gens and for the injection site reactions, you may have already answered this. Did you have a range or was it just abscesses? Did you test for if they were sterile? And I think you already answered that question that you all did in fact determine that they were sterile. But I think she wants to know what scale you were you were um, measuring them with respect to the, the type of injection site reaction that you were documenting. Yeah, I would say for us, the injection site, when we said the, um, so originally on our sort of vaccine reaction, we measured body wall. So we measured sort of the body wall measurements and looked at that as a um, reoccurring data over time to look at that reaction. When we, when we have sort of that chart that has, yes, they had a reaction or not, there was a significant accumulation of purulent material that we either um, had to monitor or had to actually treat as a wound. And so that would be where we were sort of um, marking it as an injection site abscess at that point. Okay. Um, and, and just to follow up with the jacks, so the jacks lived in the pasture with the jennies. Um, and then for us, we, just because it was hard for us to sort of live in the pasture with the jennies too, to see their reproductive behaviors every day, we would do that once a week. We would just get an idea of who was going through um, sort of that heat and do a heat detection then. And I'll say once the jacks were out with the jennies, there was um, limited responses that we were able to get because they've kind of gotten used to them and then most of them had gone into a non-cycling time frame. Um, so, so, you know, we just did natural breeding out in the pastures. So they were able to hang out all the time. 
Okay, and now this question is from Sarah King, did, and I'm reading them so that we get it on the recording, just so you know. Uh, did the donkeys continue to show receptive behavior when they were cycling similar to controls and when not cycling? So they, the, the control donkeys showed their normal natural behaviors, um, but the non-cycling donkeys in the first study definitely didn't show any, any reproductive behavior characteristics. In the second study, even the donkeys that were cycling but not um, getting pregnant, we did find that they were still showing those clinical signs. And so we were still seeing um, interest from the jacks, not always to the point, though, where we felt like we were getting um, the normal mating behavior that we would have. So we, we do have a very extensive reproductive behavior and just overall behavioral um, study that we did. It, that just takes forever to do some analysis with. And so I'm, I am looking forward to be able to get through some of that data um, to look at some of the changes in the behaviors and specifically to those that were cycling and not cycling and kind of how those behavioral changes did adjust. Okay. So this next question or comment is from uh, Margaret Nolan, whom you mentioned a little while ago in the uh, study with ponies. Um, lovely study. Uh, WRT follow up. I'm not sure what she what that acronym is for. Do you think is a think a systems immunology assessment of vaccine response would be more appropriate than a B titers given there's a clear cell mediated delay type hypersensitivity likely associated with microbacterium and then she has in parentheses Freund's. Yes, she must be talking to Hank lately. So. <laughs> We do have some plans, um, and in fact, we just enrolled a master student to get into some of those details. And so we're hoping that we can sort of look at some of the different levels and, and get into some of the specifics on the responses. Um, that it goes a little bit outside of my field. I like to look more in the clinical world, but we are definitely discussing that, and um, we do have some plans to get into the specific details about that. So good, good idea. <laughs> Um, the next question uh, comment is from Sean Callahan. Great work, Hillary and team. So the ovarian shutdown is really interesting and would be great to achieve. Question mark. Do you think it might be a tighter level issue, or do you think there is an additional ovarian mechanism? Yeah. So actually, we'd love it if they didn't go into ovarian shutdown. And so our goal really is to. Um, is to actually pinpoint those donkeys in the second study that were cycling normally but had the delay to pregnancy and, and figure out what type of a mechanism of action we were having in those vaccines um, and, and in that donkey. And so we do have plans. So the next study is to look at um, donkeys simultaneously that are cycling and non-cycling and look at the level of the ovary. Do we have reactive factors at the level of the ovary and is that where we're getting the changes and why we're seeing some have ovarian shutdown and some not? So, so yeah, definitely for our future studies, that's what we're going to be focusing on. Okay. Um, Zachary Young had another comment. He says, I live in North Dakota now and we have a large wild horse population. Is this something in the future that may be a, we may be able to use uh, with them? Yeah, so I mean, the native PZP vaccine is used in wild populations. So um, it, it is definitely, I think, more acceptable in horses and has a, a very um, approved mechanism of action there. I mean, we do see a decrease in foaling rates and we can definitely see um, the changes there. It's just in the donkeys, we're definitely seeing the bigger injection site reactions. And so um, that's where we're kind of making some of those adjustments. And, and if in the US, you can, we can have that native PZP that can be shipped. It's just thinking about um, shipping to areas that have sort of really detailed import export laws that wouldn't allow an animal byproduct to be moved from one place to the other. Um, so it is, it is used. And the only thing I would add to that is um, uh, Zonostat H or PZP, native PZP is registered uh, federally with the EPA um, and then it's registered on, in several states. I don't think North Dakota is one of the states that it's registered in right now, but that doesn't mean that it couldn't be in the future if there was a need. Um, so thank you for that question, uh, Zachary. I don't see any other questions. We have 
about 10 minutes left that we've uh, set aside for the webinar. So if there are any other questions, please submit them in the next few minutes so Dr. Uh, French can address them. And thanks everyone for joining. I appreciate all the audience. Yeah, in the, so in the second study um, between the, the treatment groups and the, uh, so between the native PZP group and the um, recombinant ZP group, we had similar, um, sorry, let me, let me say it as concinctly as I can. In the recombinant group, they did all get pregnant by the end of the study. And so we went much longer in the second study. Um, so we did end up having eight out of eight hundred percent pregnancy. Um, it's just the differences in the cyclicity throughout that time frame. And so we had some get pregnant within um, 19 weeks and then some get pregnant at 55 weeks. And so we're looking at that. The native group, we ended up with two still not pregnant on the second study. So um, definitely changes in the conception level between study one and study two. Um, but, you know, super interesting parts of how can we utilize the delay to pregnancy and sort of figure out how to better that aspect into our other um, or into our next experiments. Okay. Um, a couple of questions have come in through the chat box, so I'm going to ask a couple of those real quick. Sure. Um, we have one person that wants to know what happened to all the foals born from the Jennies involved in, I guess, either study, but specifically this most recent one. And the donkeys, or all the foals in the second study, are actually in behavioral studies here at Ross. And so um, we have actually used them as, I think they're being used as um, emotional support animals and sort of stress reduction levels for our students. Um, we actually still have our, all of the foals now. Um, and then potentially, as they get to two to three years old, we'll probably use them in, in some of our future studies. Um, with the PZP and recombinant. Okay. And then uh, let's see here. I hope I can do this right. Um, and I don't want to forget anybody. Were all of the donkeys in the second study, uh, it says naive donkeys, but I think they meant native donkeys. And have you retreated any donkeys after one year to see what kind of response a single injection would have at that time? Yeah, so the second study, all new donkeys. So all new fertile pregnant donkeys, um, all new fun and exciting times for us. Um, so they were all naive to any PZP and recombinant vaccines. Um, we have not done any follow-up studies. So we really considered, especially with this study and, and the results that we had, we, we thought long and hard about, should we just continue this study and maybe do an extra vaccine? Um, but we really wanna take a step back and look at the mechanism of action. We wanna get a bit more detail before we start thinking about those boosters and when things happen. Um, so we did ultimately decide that um, we're gonna, we're gonna restart a new set of studies. Okay. Here, I'm checking both questions. Uh, and the chat uh, room, hold on just a second. Make sure I'm not skipping anybody here. I think the next one is, can age of the Jennies and amount of times they have fold have an effect on their responsiveness to the vaccine and ovarian function? And then a second question on the tail end of that is, is there a way to determine how many uh, times the Jennies have fold in their lifetime? Wow. Do this. I'll do the second question. The answer is no. Um, for us, I we, can't, okay. we can't follow along with um, how many offspring that they've had. Um, I will tell you just anecdotally that for however many years they are, just subtract one, and you can almost say that that's how many foals they've had, just based on our experience with the fertility of the donkeys we have on this island. The, the, the first question is really interesting. So we actually had um, some older donkeys in the first study that we were um, a little concerned about as far as like, would they change our results because they were on that later in, so kind of the 13 or, or older um, stage. And, and they were 
probably the the most fertile. So one of them was in the control group and one of them was in the treatment group. And I think one the older one was actually one of them to come back and get pregnant um, in that PZP group. So yeah, so it was super interesting. The ages don't seem to matter. And I, I took out some of the materials and methods, so I was trying to make it a little bit shorter presentation, but um, mm -hmm. we did have a range from three to 14 as um, for our donkeys. And so we saw no effect in age, um, didn't really see effect in body condition scores. So it, it, it you know, nice that we had a, a variety of animals to look through. And then uh, Dave Powell had a, a follow up question. So there were no differences in pregnancy rates between the studies. I can't remember if you addressed that question. I think so. So the first study we had kind of a, a very limited conception rate. The second study uh, we had a lot of pregnancies eventually, um, just kind of the differences between the two and how they were in effect. Um, so I, I think I addressed it in a roundabout way. <laughs> okay. Okay. I'm looking at the chat room. I don't see any additional questions. I'm looking at the question. Q&A and I don't see any uh, uh, additional ones there. Um, so we have uh, just a little under four minutes. Um, while uh, people think of any additional questions they may want to ask while we're still recording that they would want to uh, share with anybody that checks this webinar out in the future. I um, just want to thank Dr. French for the time that she took to put together this excellent presentation and to share it with us and everybody that subscribes to our newsletter and tunes in for our webinars from time to time and everybody that will be watching it in the future once we post it on the website. Thank you so much. Thank you. This has been excellent and all the funding that Bostober provided has really helped us be able to provide all this information. So we're looking forward to all the information to come. Thank you. Join in to thank you, Hillary. Thanks very much. It's Monique. Thank you. Thanks, and, um, yeah, to see the webinar when it is posted, it's www.wildlifefertilitycontrol.org. Okay, I think with that, we'll wrap up for today. Thank you again so much, Dr. French. We really appreciate it. Thank you. Hi, everybody. Thank you for tuning in. Bye.